Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Real Engineering, where we look at movies and TV shows with both surprisingly good and laughably bad depictions of engineering. This time, we're going back to the James Bond universe to look at the film that finally cemented the venerable Bond formula, 1964's Goldfinger. As always, a quick recap. While on vacation in Miami, Bond is assigned to investigate one Aura Goldfinger, an international businessman with a deep and abiding obsession with gold. The British government knows Goldfinger is smuggling his gold out of the UK to take advantage of higher foreign prices, but doesn't know exactly how he's doing it. Bond travels to Switzerland and infiltrates Goldfinger's smelting facility, where he discovers that not only is Goldfinger smuggling his gold by replacing parts of his Rolls Royce with it, but also that he is plotting something far more sinister called Operation Grand Slam. Goldfinger captures Bond, and after an iconic scene in which he tries to cut the super spy in half with a giant laser, decides to keep him alive instead to allay suspicion. Bond is taken to Goldfinger's stud farm in Kentucky, where he finally learns the details of Operation Grand Slam. With the help of some gangsters, a Chinese nuclear physicist, and his own personal flying circus, Goldfinger plans to break into Fort Knox and detonate a nuclear weapon inside, irradiating the U.S. gold reserve and inflating the value of his own gold. After turning Goldfinger's personal pilot, Pussy Galore, in a decidedly problematic scene, Bond and the U.S. Army manage to foil Goldfinger's plan and disarm the bomb with just seconds left on the timer. The end. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking I'd go after the film's most iconic piece of tech, Goldfinger's giant laser of doom. But aside from laser beams, especially of the cutting variety typically being invisible, there actually isn't a whole lot wrong with that particular scene. Instead, I'll be examining one of Bond's most deceptively mundane gadgets. In an early scene in the film, Bond visits Q Branch and is presented with the first incarnation of a franchise staple, the gadget-laden spy car. In this case, it's the iconic Aston Martin DB5 fitted with rotating license plates, bulletproof rear screen, passenger ejection seat, wheel hub tire shredders, headlight machine guns, smoke screen, oil slick, and, last but not least, a dashboard map display. This latter device receives signals from a pair of radio homing beacons, a large magnetic one that Bond places on Goldfinger's car, and a smaller one that fits into the heel of his shoe so MI6 and the CIA can keep tabs on him. While from a modern perspective this seems unimpressive, even smaller GPS beacons can be purchased for relatively cheap today, Given the technology of the mid-1960s, such a system as depicted would actually have been impossible. And the reason has to do with triangulation. Locating an object on a 2D plane requires two coordinates, X and Y, relative to a fixed reference or origin. In radio direction finding, this is typically done using two receiving stations, each of which establishes a separate bearing to the radio beacon. Solving the resulting triangle gives the location of the beacon. Bond, with a single receiver in the car, would not be able to carry out this procedure. Even if he had a separate receiver at the front and back of the car, the distance between the two, and hence the difference in bearings to the beacon, would be too small to get an accurate fix. However, there is another method of locating objects on a 2D plane, with polar coordinates, consisting of an angle and a distance from a fixed origin. The bearing to a beacon is easily determined using either a rotating loop antenna or a special fixed antenna such as that used in the high-frequency direction-finding or huff duff systems used by Allied ships to track German U-boats during the Second World War. But this system still leaves the distance to the beacon ambiguous. In order to determine this, Bond's car would have to be fitted with an active homing system whereby the car sends out its own signal and waits for the homing beacon to repeat it back. Multiplying the delay between transmission and reception by the speed of light and dividing by half gives the distance to the beacon. Unfortunately, as depicted in the film, the receiver appears to be entirely passive, which is probably to Bond's advantage as continuously broadcasting an active homing signal would make it extremely easy for his enemies to track him. But even if the DB5 used an active tracking system, it still wouldn't work as depicted in the film. Single receiver tracking systems can only give a bearing and distance to a beacon relative to the receiver itself, but later in the film, when Bond's shoe beacon goes dead, the CIA agents watching him are shown scrolling around an electronic map looking for the signal, implying that the beacon's location is fixed relative not to their car, but to some external reference. This, in turn, implies the existence of a worldwide system of receiving stations, or satellites as in the global positioning system, which independently triangulate the position of the beacon and transmit this location to the car's map display. 
but no such system existed in 1964, the first prototype GPS satellite not being launched until 1978. Bond's sophisticated tracking system would therefore have been impossible at the time. So there you have it. Even some of the most seemingly mundane Bond gadgets were actually science fiction, proving that 007 was always ahead of the curve. Another aspect of the film worth mentioning is the nuclear bomb Goldfinger obtains from the Chinese to irradiate Fort Knox. While explaining his plan to Bond, Goldfinger mentions that the device is based on cobalt and iodine and is particularly dirty. He's likely referring to a cobalt-salted bomb, in which the core of the weapon is surrounded by a jacket of cobalt metal. When the bomb detonates, the intense neutron flux transmutes the stable isotope cobalt-59 into highly radioactive cobalt-60, which can then contaminate a large area and render it uninhabitable for decades. A number of other salting agents are also possible, including iodine, tantalum, zinc, and, appropriately, gold. First proposed by Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard in 1950, the salted bomb also formed the basis of the doomsday machine in the Stanley Kubrick film Dr. Strangelove, released the same year as Goldfinger. But while the physics of Goldfinger's bomb are feasible, its source is rather less so. As China only carried out its first nuclear weapons test, codenamed Project 596, on October 16, 1964, a full month after Goldfinger premiered. Not only was this bomb based on the early American Fat Man and Soviet RDS-1 designs and thus significantly larger than the device depicted in the film, but it was fueled by uranium-235, an isotope that is far more time and labor intensive to separate and enrich than reactor-bred plutonium-239. It is thus unlikely that the Chinese would have had any nuclear material left over to share with Goldfinger. It only gets worse from there. When the bomb arrives at Fort Knox, it is housed in an appropriately nondescript metal box, preserving its air of menace and mystery. But when Bond manages to break the box open, wow. Just wow. Granted, the internal architecture of many nuclear weapons or physics packages are still classified to this day, but I can guarantee that precisely none look like whatever this clockpunk fever dream is supposed to be. While real nuclear warheads sometimes have moving parts such as safety devices or the mechanism in boosted fission bombs that injects tritium gas into the core, what all these other moving bits and bobs are supposed to be, I have no idea. While production designer Ken Adam almost single-handedly invented the distinct look of Bond movies, it just goes to show that even the greats can sometimes produce a dud now and then. Thank you for watching, and see you on another episode of Real Engineering, only on our own devices.